Hello, my friends. You know, I've done videos in the past in which I've taken forever to get to the point, and for that, I sincerely apologize. Uh, luckily, this isn't one of those videos. That was the coda at the end of the song Rapture of the Deep, the first track off of John Clemmer's Intensity album. Let's listen to that again. In this video, we'll dig into these absolutely insane chord changes and try to make sense of them with some hardcore music analysis. And we'll also talk about the man behind them, the brilliant tenor saxophonist John Clemmer, and try to figure out why this song hasn't taken its place alongside giant steps in the annals of jazz history. But before we do that, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and click that bell icon, because every bell click that you make, Google will donate $1 to the Save the Bell Foundation to support underprivileged bells all over the world. In the meantime, my name is Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Yeah. And I am a music addict, but enough about me. This is John Clemmer's Rapture of the Deep. John Clemmer is an American tenor saxophonist who came to prominence in the late 1960s. His first album, 1967's Involvement, was recorded when he was just 20 years old. and was an impressive mix of soul, jazz, and post-bop. Overlooked gem, really. For a young man who had only just started playing tenor sax in high school, his chops are already remarkable. His second album, And We Were Lovers, <clears throat> okay, let us never speak of that again. His third album was the innovative and once again overlooked Blow and Gold from 1969, a uh, blend of jazz, rock, and soul that was really one of the earliest fusion albums. Uh, the opening notes of the album, in fact, feature his sax being run through a fuzz box, and I'm not aware of too many earlier recordings in which that had been attempted. Very cool stuff, very forward-thinking, and very highly recommended. By the way, this record here, it's not actually Blow and Gold. I, I know it says it, but it's actually a compilation entitled Blow and Gold that contains the entire Blow and Gold album, uh, but most of two other albums as well. Uh, it's actually the exact same compilation as this, this lovely uh, compilation here entitled Magic Moments. Why, why, why do record companies do this kind of <laughs> Clemmer's next several albums, including Eruptions, All the Children Cried, and Constant Throb, uh, built upon this foundation of Blow and Gold, and they mixed modal jazz with rock rhythms and often incorporated a spacey and spiritual ambience. Uh, to that end, he developed a signature sound that incorporated an echoplex, which is demonstrated beautifully at the beginning of his Waterfalls album. This brings us to 1973's Intensity album on the Impulse label and the topic of today's video, the song Rapture of the Deep. First of all, let's quickly discuss the album cover and give you guys a quick photography lesson. Uh, if you're shooting a subject that's backlit, uh, in other words, one in which the uh, primary light source is located behind the subject, uh, you should really add some fill flash or maybe use a reflector to bounce some of that light onto the front of your subject. Uh, otherwise, you'll end up looking like our friend Mr. Clemmer here, uh, losing much of the detail in his face and nearly all the detail in what I'm sure are some pretty fly, perhaps even uh, dope threads. Uh, the lens flare is uh, very J.J. Abrams, though. Uh, if you're looking for lens flare, then, then great. If not, a uh, lens hood should help. Anyway, I digress. The first track of the album is the aforementioned Rapture of the Deep. Here's what Clemmer's liner notes have to say about it. Rapture of the Deep is a high-energy piece of music. As the piece builds, you can feel the intensity and pressure of being thousands of feet below the ocean. Dark, exotic, curious and frightening. As we performed this piece, it seemed that the music we were creating overpowered us. The music seemed to take on its own existence. A short time after we began the piece, we all suddenly seemed to be soaring on top of the electricity and energy force we were creating. The composition is basically modal in approach, except for the bridge section. The bridge section is comprised of 8 bars of chord changes. 4 changes to a bar. 32 different chord changes in all. They are set up in patterns of whole steps, half steps and major and minor thirds. It is a challenge to improvise over these 32 different chord changes at a fast tempo. As the chords are being sounded at such a fast pace, they lose their individual identities and become one cluster of sound. 
This cluster of sound allows a vast choice of notes to play. Wow, that's a lot to digest. Oh, okay, let's let's start from the top. The song starts with Dave Parlato's wah-wah bass playing a repeating ostinato of D to A to E, a 1-5-9, if you will. Uh, the, uh, the E getting bent up slightly, but almost, uh, eh, but not quite to, to F. The drums in the Rhodes enter shortly thereafter, with Tom Canning, the uh, electric piano player, improvising chords in a way that reminds me kind of of Herbie Hancock at the beginning of the tune Masculero from Miles Davis's Sorcerer album. Clemmer comes in at around the 1 minute and 11 second mark and takes over the 159 melody from the bass, uh, while the bass moves on to kind of a basic D pedal tone. The whole thing modulates down a step to C at the 124 mark, and then back to D at 132. Now this is cool, I, I love the modal thing, don't get me wrong, but I, I wouldn't be making this video if it just did this for the entire song. It's at the 138 mark that this happens. All right, here's my transcription of what's going on. Uh, nearly everything is a major seven chord. In, in fact, I'm guessing that Clemmer's original chart for the session uh, was originally entirely major sevens, but Canning tended to play sus twos for the last two chords of the sequence in anticipation of the return to that D pedal tone with kind of the suspended chords uh, underneath it. Uh, so that's how I chose to annotate it here. Uh, I've arbitrarily referred to all the chords in their flat and harmonic equivalents. Uh, if you'd like to argue that any of these chords should be expressed differently, please, please be my guest in the comments below. As the liner notes state, all of the chords generally shift up or down in major thirds, minor thirds, whole steps, and half steps, though there are some tritones as well. Uh, even in 1973, the tritone was best left unspoken, I suppose. Uh, the sequence begins at B-flat major, and then descends a major third to G-flat, ascends a minor third to A, and descends a major third to F, and ascends a minor third to A-flat. So, so far, it's an unusual set of changes, but at least there's a repeating pattern to it. Down a major third, up a minor third. Uh, here's what it all sounds like. This pattern changes with the sixth chord of the sequence, which ascends a tritone up to D. Uh, from there we go up a half step to E flat, up a major third to G, up another tritone to D flat, up a half step back to D, another tritone to A flat, and down another half step to G. That all sounds like this. Now, if I stare at the page long enough, I could almost convince myself that there were some tritone substitutions happening here. Uh, hear me out. A flat, or G sharp if you want to look at it that way, could be considered a tritone sub for D, and D flat, or C sharp, could be considered the tritone sub for G. Undo these substitutions, and you'd have D, D, E flat, G. G, D, D, G. How nice! Now, let's, let's treat the E-flat as a passing chord, and we'll have two full measures in the key of D, right? Right? All right, forget that tritone subs are only supposed to be used for dominant chords. This, this is definitively the correct interpretation, and I'm sticking to it. Next measure. The G from the last measure ascends up a major third to B, down a half step to B-flat, down a minor third back to G, and down another half step to G-flat. We start the next measure down another major third to D. From that D, we move up a couple half steps to E flat and E, and then uh, up a major third to A flat. We then travel down a whole step to G flat, up a minor third to A, down a half step to A flat, and then finally back down to E. One could theoretically consider those last six chords to have been in the key of E, with the uh, A flat, G flat, and A flat again as passing chords. Uh, had the E been a dominant chord, in fact, the entirety of these last two measures could have been thought of as the key of A. A major 7, D major 7, E7, and a few chromatic passing chords. But 
It's not, so it isn't, and we move on. We move down a half step from our E to E flat, then down a minor third to C. From there, we move down one devil's interval to G flat, and down a major third to D. All together, those sound like. Okay, all right, friends, we're on the home stretch. 28 chords down, four to go. We descend down a major third from the D to B flat, and down a minor third to G. The last two chords are somewhat up for debate. My guess is that the lead sheet in the session had an E flat major seven followed by an A major seven, uh, so down a major third followed by another tritone. Uh, but as I mentioned before, Canning seems to be using these last two chords as kind of a transition or segue back into the modal suspended chords over the, the D pedal tone. So uh, in the first chord sequence, uh, I'm hearing uh, what sounds to be like a B flat sus two over E flat. Uh, and then that's followed by a B sus 2 over A. And I believe that he's starting to hold down the sustain pedal on the road, so the two suspended chords kind of bleed together. Now that we know the chords, how does Clemmer actually approach soloing over these rapid fire changes? Well, there's only so much you can do that's harmonically interesting uh, over these really fast changes. The, the chords just go by too quickly, and in spite of my analysis efforts, it's really hard to find much functional harmony in there. He plays a lot of arpeggios using the 7th, 5th, and 3rd of the chord, usually in that order, uh, and often adding the uh, octave root after the 7th. And then he combines that with some insane chromatic runs, uh, usually leading up to a chord tone in the approaching chord. By the way, using patterns is a very smart way to go when you're dealing with tough chord changes that fly by. Just listen to Giant Steps and you'll hear Coltrane employ a 1-2-3-5 note pattern repeatedly in his solo. Also, much like Giant Steps, we get to listen to a poor keyboard player struggle over the changes for a short period of time before the tenor player bursts in and mercifully saves him. Mr. Canning, I'm sorry to do this to you, but... By the way, speaking of Coltrane, this LP also has excellent songs named Prayer for John Coltrane and Waltz for John Coltrane, so it's, it's clear that Clemmer held uh, the utmost respect and reverence for Mr. Coltrane. So yes, perhaps the changes don't make much sense from a functional standpoint, but I think they sound unique and exciting, and the sheer randomness of these changes, for lack of a better term, makes Clemmer's playing all that much more impressive. The album as a whole is terrific. I mean, it's one of my favorites, really. I'm, just not sure why it didn't have much of an impact upon its release in 1973. And for reasons unbeknownst to me, this album has never seen a re-release in the digital era. No CD version, no digital download to be found anywhere. And yes, you can find part of the album on YouTube, but that's about it. It's kind of a shame, and it certainly helps to explain why the song has had no tangible historical impact. Well, I'm hoping that this video will go a ways to remedying that situation. Quick side note, this album, like much of Impulse's catalog around this time was mixed in QS quadraphonic sound. It'll play back perfectly normally on a regular stereo, but it'll play back very nicely in four channels when run through an appropriate hardware or software decoder. On Rapture of the Deep, Canning's Rhodes is panned to the rear speakers, which cleans up the mix considerably. It's really cool. Uh, if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about when I mention quadraphonic, don't worry. I'll be doing a video on that topic in the near future. The Impulse record label has changed hands a few times over the years and is now part of the Universal Music Group, who I'm sure will be totally cool and not take this video down because it is a work of research and commentary and therefore covered under fair use. It was reported that a large number of Impulse master recordings were wiped out in their archive fire back in 2008, although a UMG archivist has since gone on to claim that the Impulse recordings survived. So maybe there's hope for a re-release someday. As for John Clemmer, well, shortly after the Intensity album came out, he altered his musical approach significantly and ended up pioneering what would later be referred to as smooth jazz. His albums Touch and Barefoot Ballet were quite successful, really. They aren't my cup of tea, but they do what they do very well. There's a very good chance that you've also heard his sax solo on Steely Dan's Caves of Altamira on the Royal Scam album, uh, which I will not be playing for you at this time for fear of demonetization and any number of awful things that could possibly happen to me. Clemmer went on to make some beautifully recorded albums like uh, 1979's Brasilia and uh, 1981's direct-to-disc recording 
finesse. Uh, but then after 1982, I, just next to nothing. He released one album in 1989, one in 1997, one in 1998, and then like crickets. His website has been updated to include some YouTube videos, but otherwise looks like a time capsule from the late 1990s. Honestly, it's very charming in that regard. So Mr. Clemmer, if you are out there, thank you. Thank you very much for your brilliant playing and for making some of the wildest chord changes that we'll ever hear. Uh, if you're ever, ever, ever willing to do an interview, please drop me a line because it would be an absolute honor to do so. And uh, on, on a personal note, I'm kind of going off script here a little bit, but uh, I mean, you guys can tell, obviously, I'm a big fan of this guy. I have all of his records, just about all of his records. I think there's a couple that I'm missing, but you can see that I have multiple copies of a whole bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of records. I think the guy's brilliant. I think he's a fantastic tenor player and uh, for some reason has just gone, gone largely overlooked in the uh, annals of jazz history and I don't quite understand why uh, because his playing is just, just phenomenal and some of his compositions are super, super cool. So, uh, so yes, I'm hoping that this video does a little bit to, uh, to bring him to the, the public consciousness and uh, you know maybe have, a, uh, maybe have a John Clemmer renaissance, I don't know. Hopefully, we'll see. In the meantime, to my faithful viewers, thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe, click that little bell icon, let's save the bells, and uh, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.